A new dawn is coming slowly to Africa. Through the smoky veil of international agreements and the disaster of climate change, groups and governments are tackling a mountain of paperwork, planting trees, and trying to capture a part of the growing carbon economy. The Kyoto Protocol outlines the rules for carbon trading using a system called the Clean Development Mechanism, or CDM. CDM is the Bible of carbon trading, but does not make much allowance for forests that actually remove the carbon from the air. The numbers say everything. Only 3% of all CDM certified carbon credits come from Africa, and out of hundreds of applications, only one forestry project has CDM certified carbon credits to sell. The CDM framework, because of its large politics and business based background, only deals with large politics and business based people. Eco Securities is one of the biggest carbon trading and development groups in the world. They have offices in 22 countries worldwide, and they agree that the CDM system needs to include African forests. Somewhere in the amendments to the current Kyoto Protocol after 2012, that's we need to come up with a system that it makes, that makes it worthwhile for African countries to do forestry truck projects. Nine years and half a million dollars into the certification process, a project run by Norwegian company Green Resources in Tanzania is on the verge of becoming the second CDM certified forestry project in Africa. Following the CDM rules, their project already helps to remove carbon from the air and slow the destruction of Tanzania's remaining hardwood forest. Green Resources has been giving out seedlings from their farms and bringing environmental education to the communities surrounding their projects. At a secondary school near their Mapanda tree plantation, students sing songs they have written about the environment, especially the need to plant trees. As part of their CDM compliance, Green Resources is giving away 20% of all their seedlings to encourage local communities to plant their own fuel. Mwaniki Ngibuini, the environmental director at Green Resources, explains. And our company is also supporting farmers in growing their own wood on their own woodlots. We give 20% of uh, total seedlings pro produced to the farmers so that they can grow um, wood for their poles, for their fuel on their own farms and they have no need to go and cut in the natural forest. This tree planting project has allowed local communities to not only meet their energy needs, but also sell part of their tree crop for a profit. At one of the planting projects in Mapanda, village elder Mabasola Kisonga explains what it means for him to have his own trees. <laughs> Green Resources plants fast-growing, exotic, foreign species of trees like pine and eucalyptus. There is an argument among environmentalists about whether this sort of forestry project should be encouraged through carbon trading. This is not the forum for that argument, yet there is a growing appreciation that at least in areas of high rainfall, they are easier to harvest and grow quickly, so can help stop more widespread destruction of indigenous hardwood forests. The, the, the idea of, of course of planting um, exotic fast growing species is that they, they grow much faster than the natural um, miombo species. And in, in Tanzania, yeah, um, clearing of the miombo is going on at a very alarming rate. And um, if nothing is done about it, we have no miombo forests in the future. Sub-Saharan Africa's forests are in crisis. The booming cities of the region rely on charcoal made from old growth hardwood forests. Many African countries are lobbying at the Copenhagen Climate Convention to make it easier to certify forests for carbon trading. Green Resources and its partner business run one of the biggest timber plantations and sawmills in East Africa. As a timber company, 
they generate a lot of waste that is being recycled in a novel way. Joshua Mabonga is the biofuel manager at the mill. This company is planting trees and it's operating sustainable basis. So all the waste will also be sustainably utilized. The mill produces a staggering 50,000 tons of sawdust and waste per year, which used to be burnt. The company has embarked on an ambitious new program to create charcoal in these ovens from this waste material and provide it to households, stopping them from collecting it in the natural forests. The company we have acquired, briquetting plant, which is going to densify, it's going to densify this light charcoal into heavy density briquettes. And by the next year, middle of next year, we shall be in production of briquettes, which will be available to, to household use. Charcoal is one of the most damaging extractive industries to Africa's forests. Every morning, in lines like these in Blantyre, Malawi, every city in the region sucks in hardwood charcoal for fuel. In Malawi, charcoal has been recognized by the government as particularly damaging, so they have outlawed it. Yet this approach has obviously not worked. In Mozambique, Alan Schwartz, director of the Mozambique Forest Project, explains the rate of this wood loss. More than 90% of the population is dependent on fuel wood for their energy. Uh, that works out at about two cubic meters per person per year. If you really want to get some scary figures, what that means is 120 million trees a year are being lost for energy. Now, biomass as a rule is not necessarily a bad thing to use for energy. The only problem is if you're using it and not putting it back. Carbon trading, in theory, is simple. Carbon emitters under the Kyoto Protocol buy carbon credits from developing countries that clean up their industries. But the architecture of the Kyoto Protocol is so expensive and time-consuming to negotiate that a forest is almost impossible to certify for full carbon credits. As a big international timber company with millions of dollars, Green Resources is trying to navigate the labyrinthine CDM certification process. Constantine Christian is Green Resources' accountant. He puts the problem into perspective. Okay, so far we have spent about 0 0.6 million US dollars in um, doing all these CDM registration processes. As of today, we are yet to benefit from CDM. The company hopes that at least one of their projects will get CDM certification soon, but already they have been able to get credits from the parallel carbon market where people voluntarily sell their carbon. Yes, we've been certified in two forest projects, that is Uchindire and Mapanda. And um, when the certification was done in 2006, um, the amount of carbon that was certified was about 230,000 tons. These credits are sold outside the CDM system, but more and more, their value is being appreciated by companies that wish to lower their carbon footprint voluntarily. So the CDM must adapt its way of dealing with things to deal with units which are smaller, that can be afforded by the guys on the ground. Despite the difficult process, many groups and companies throughout Sub-Saharan Africa are trying to make carbon trading through forestry a reality. In South Africa's far southeast corner, climate change is forcing traditional farming practices to be abandoned. Farmers like Peter Kruger are attempting to use carbon trading to rehabilitate their drought-scarred farms and turn them into a vast CO2 storage system that earns carbon credits. And I don't think we will ever farm again, really. It's, farming is not for this area. <laughs> there is no choice, since the water he used to use in the 1990s to farm his land is now gone. We used to plant vegetable seeds, but it's totally dried out now. We can do nothing with this land. You see this picture here from how this area looked before when it was still in production. We used to produce about 40 tons of uh, seeds on this farm. 
This area was once home to all the big African animals, surviving in tandem with the subtropical thicket supported by the local indigenous plant, Speckbuum. You can clearly see on these images the fence lines that separate the healthy thicket from grazing land where sheep and goat farming has decimated the Speckbuum. Where the Speckbuum is gone, the place is turned into a desert. On the other side of the fence is healthy Speckbuum thicket, Speckboom Thicket not only helps retain scarce water, it is also an excellent way to take carbon out of the atmosphere. Dieter van den Broek works for the South African non-governmental organization Living Lands. It's from South Africa, it's indigenous from South Africa, from this region. It's what they say, it's a carbon sink. They call it really a carbon sink, but it's the special thing, it's about, it, it sequestrates a lot of carbon, but it produces a lot of litter. So when you go under a speck bomb, there is a lot of litter there, a lot of organic matter that goes into the soil. So it's, it's not only above carbon, but it's in the litter and below carbon, there is a lot. So that's, that's the, the speciality of this tree. What you see here, is dried bare soil but here you see a full grown healthy speck bomb it doesn't only make the area healthy but the secret is it sequestrates co2 in its dead leaves and twigs this is co2 that's what it's about partnerships are vital in a large-scale project of this kind and by aligning the needs of many groups, the project hopes to re-energize the local economy while improving the environment. Why, why this project is so successful, we have a really good partnership where the South African government, through the Working for Water program, is investing a lot of money in it. We got the Dutch government involved, so you have that security of governments involved. We work closely with Eastern Cape Parks, who is the managers of the area. We have a good scientific basis, are doing research to support the work. And mainly we work a lot together with the farmers in the local community. Those are the drivers of the project and we try to support them. These are the possibilities of carbon trading. But right now, it is difficult to certify carbon credits gained from forestry projects but there are ways to sell carbon credits without getting official CDM certification. Hank Sa from carbon trading group EcoSecurities explains about carbon trading's voluntary market. We, we have the, the, the compliance market, the CDM system, and separate from that we have the voluntary market. Within that voluntary market, there are certain um, standards. One of them, probably the most prominent one at the moment, is the VCS, the Voluntary Carbon Standard. This is to um, provide a level of, of, of a quality stamp on a voluntary emission reduction. What's really interesting is the voluntary markets are actually very big. And the voluntary markets need to actually be acknowledged by the CDM. But even the best voluntary carbon credit is worth only half of a fully certified one. South Africa and many other countries will lobby to have forestry projects like this one included in a new carbon trading agreement. And I think the most amazing thing about this plant, what you just do, you cut a piece of specky off like this, you leave it for two days, dry out a little bit, you stuck it in the ground and it grows. And a lot of other trees, you need seedlings, you need to grow seedling in nursery, and that really makes a lot of more costs. We need to go to something that's sustainable in the long run. And I think the speck boom is, 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 is one of the... Uh, plants that we can plant here and it will give us uh, a future for this area. <laughs> By offering cash incentives for this carbon through the carbon trading system, it will not only strengthen the local economy, but will hopefully slow the climate change taking place here. So it's a good thing if farmers can give something back which they took away from nature. The project hopes to replant hundreds of thousands of hectares of speckboom, provide thousands of jobs in the poorest areas of the country, and soak up millions of tons of CO2. Forest destruction is a problem throughout the region, but in a small developing country like Malawi, it is an environmental catastrophe. Malawi is one of the most deforested countries in the world, and the remaining forests and woodlands are being cut down at an alarming rate. Throughout the country, timber cutting by local communities has been reducing former forests to marginal farmland. A year ago, thick Miombo woodland covered this area near Mangochi, 
but the relentless need for energy from communities and a lack of other viable fuel options has seen it disappear. But there may be some hope. Technology is coming to the Malawian countryside, and it's something to sing about. On a recent Sunday in Manjanja village, a group has gotten together to sing, to gossip, and to make mbaula chiteteza stoves. This is the Mbaula Chitetezo stove. Its name means environmental protection. Though simple, the stove has radically reduced the amount of wood Malawian households need for their energy. In the past, the three stone fire, like this one, was the best technology available. The stove burns cleaner for much longer on less than half the wood, and it's made from locally sourced materials. Linda Chiwaya explains how using this technology has changed life in her village. Yeah. The technology is in the design. The materials and building techniques are local and affordable. Hestian Innovations, a plucky Irish company concerned about deforestation and looking for ways to get Africa involved in the carbon economy, appreciated the difficulty of carbon trading through forestry. If we could get carbon credits, CEORs, through the CTDM here in Malawi for reforesting with smallholder farmers, we would love to do it. But we know that it's just too difficult. It's too complicated, so we're better off focusing in on energy efficiency. They looked at the problem in a different way. What if they could reduce forest destruction by using technology to reduce wood consumption and in turn reduce CO2 emissions. The technology we're promoting reduces the need for wood. So instead of using 10 pieces of wood, they can now use four pieces of wood. This is a big cost saving for them, but it also reduces pressure on the forest. So there's less trees being cut down. Tobacco is one of the main cash crops throughout Malawi. The most lucrative tobacco is cured in wood-fired kilns. The technology that Hestian Innovations is promoting reduces wood consumption in these kilns by about 50%. These are called rocket barns, and in two years, they have sold almost a thousand of them. We're at the stage now where we've got about 800, 900 of these barns out there. The farmers are talking about them, they're loving the idea, they want more barns. Demand is very high. We can bring them this cleaner technology that can benefit their lives. By selling stoves and barns through microloans on a massive scale, and using carbon financing to help fund part of the costs, Hestian Innovations reduces carbon emissions and makes their money through a long-term monitoring system, which measures how much CO2 is not going into the atmosphere. We don't get a carbon credit for building a barn or for building a stove. We get carbon credits when we can verifiably demonstrate that these technologies are working. So we're not going to build the barn for this farmer and walk away. We have to come back here every year for the next six years, possibly for the next 20 years. And that's something very good. That's after sales service that just doesn't exist. It is a long-term commitment that is rare in Africa, even among aid agencies. And right now, that commitment is coming from carbon trading. Our project would never have got to where it is today without carbon trading and carbon trading gives us very ambitious targets to reach and we can reach them.
African forests can be a part of the solution to global warming. Africans and project developers in Africa are eager and prepared to enter the carbon trade and use it to create sustainable forestry projects. Already, their carbon has entered the voluntary markets, and buyers have responded positively, but it is not enough. What they need is the chance to get a full, fair price for the carbon they take out of the cycle, certified by the CDM, and available to compulsory buyers who pay a premium. This December, their voices are being taken to the Copenhagen Conference of the Parties in hopes that the world's decision makers will hear them and take their experience to heart. Sangito Sumari is the managing director of Green Resources Limited in Tanzania. For the people who are meeting at Copenhagen, uh, who I, will, I will advise them to, to simplify the procedure in accessing the carbon money so that it will encourage them to plant more trees, which will re reduce the amount of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. My message to Copenhagen will be, first of all, try to fund projects that are collaborations between a lot of organizations, not one-man show, one NGO show. Second of all, that it is not only about CO2, uh, CO2 projects, it is uh, CO2 sequestration, but the economical impact, social impact, it restores the area. And the last thing is, I think really it has to be a locally driven project. It has to help the people on the ground, not just come in and plant trees, but really find out what is that problem on the area, help those people and use the money that comes out of the CO3, uh, the carbon market as a vehicle to restore, to help people out. And that's, I think, my message really to Copenhagen. I would ask um, in Copenhagen that the system be much easier, um, less expensive, so that more people can plant trees. And, uh, and when more trees are planted, then they play a, a much bigger role in regulating climate and uh, getting rid of the carbon, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I would say to the people meeting in Copenhagen in December that there are plenty of opportunities in Africa to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. What needs to happen is for the rules and the regulations to become more user-friendly. The CDM process is very complicated and it doesn't really need to be that complicated. It can be simplified, especially for least developed countries that share many similar characteristics. If I was a delegate in, in, in Copenhagen, um, three things would be on my mind. The first one would be a total sense of urgency. Um, talking about climate change is not going to resolve the problem. Um, so we need to make, take drastic action in the shortest possible time span. The second one would be climate change is a global problem. There is no such thing as I'm not an emitter so I'm not affected. Everybody's affected by everybody's emissions, full stop. So there needs to be a, a global solution. So I think your second most pressing point should be uh, to get everybody on board. The third point I would be uh, interested in is um, it needs to be pragmatic. Um, no fuzzy mat, no mumbo jumbo, no very complicated structures, um, but straight and trans transparent methods and means and measures to reduce the global carbon footprint made by humanity. When you're thinking in Copenhagen, go back to square one. Basic principles. You're there in order to reduce carbon emissions, but you're also there because it's about climate to reduce forest destruction and to reduce the change in landscape, such as burning does, so that we can actually all live a hell of a lot better. And make sure that when you create an incentive, it's an incentive for all of us, not just for you. Forests can create and modify the weather. They secure water in the ground, and they remove carbon from the atmosphere. Forests are our stockade against runaway climate change and the best hope for uplifting Africa. Where they have been removed, they need to be replaced like our lives depend on it. Because they do. Yeah, you don't need your mind.